Hello, my name is Imogen and we will be looking at records from the archives which give us an insight into the Battle of Trafalgar, which took place on the 21st of October 1805. Lady Hamilton wrote to Vice Admiral George Murray some time after the Battle of the Nile that she hopes to have the happiness and honour of your company, for she loves dearly all seamen, but particularly those spoken so highly of by our brave Admiral, Lord Nelson. We will first look at the close friendship between Lord Nelson and George Murray. It is by pure chance that Murray did not serve during the battle and Lord Nelson did not fill his absence but deciding that none but Murray would do. By far the most fascinating of our records are the collection of letters written by Lord Nelson to Murray in the early 1800s. One such letter compliments Murray for his gallant support at the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801 while another congratulates Murray on the birth of his son, saying, if you do not call him Baltic, I should be very angry with you. Indeed, he can be called anything alike. Murray's surface record shows he was captain of the fleet aboard the Victory from 1803 to 1805. Interestingly, disembark him in August 1805, a mere two months before the Battle of Trafalgar. This was in order to settle the estate of his father-in-law, Colonel Christopher Teasdale. This meant that Murray was surprisingly absent for the battle in October. This absence may explain why we have a souvenir piece of the victory sale in this collection. Lord Nelson's regard for Murray was such that his position as captain of the fleet was left vacant and his duties were unofficially carried out by the victory's flag captain, Captain Thomas Hardy. With the absence of Murray at Trafalgar, we have to look to other sources for what happened. So for an account of the action, we have the testimony of midshipman William Stanhope Badcock aboard the Neptune, and then an account written to the Admiralty and published in the London Ex Gazette Extraordinary by Admiral Cuthbert Collingwood, second in command aboard the Royal Sovereign. In their descriptions of the battle written within a few days after the event, we find that the French and Spanish fleet outnumbered the British. Lord Nelson's battle plan relied heavily on the skill and experience of his men and the superior firepower of his ship's guns. Collingwood even commented that very few signals were needed between the British fleet, except those to direct close orders as the lines bore down. It has been said that the British were so efficient with their firing that it was impossible for the French and Spanish fleet to keep up. In these accounts, we hear that Lord Nelson split his fleet into two columns, Nelson leading from the front in the victory and Admiral Collingwood from the rear in the Royal Sovereign. Collingwood's account in Buckle MS 225 shows which ships of the fleet followed which Admiral, including the Neptune's position in the line. What's also interesting is that we have a list of ships in the French and Spanish fleet compiled by Badcock. Both Badcock and Collingwood's account record the loss of Lord, Lord Nelson, and we have two invitations to his funeral, which was, awarded, which was awarded all the pomp and ceremony of a state one. One invitation was given to Henry Pigeon and the other Rear Admiral George Murray, as he was then titled. I hope you enjoyed our foray into the Battle of Trafalgar, and if you'd like to know more, check out our blog or contact us at the Record Office. Thank you.